everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Nothing exceeds like excess. <laughs> Remember that old saying? No, nothing I don't. Nothing succeeds like success. Nothing. Oh, nothing succeeds like, like success. Like success. Ah, okay. Of course, excess comes in many shapes and sizes. Excess stuff, excess debt, excess screen time and commitments and emotional clutter. With all the advertisements and stimuli we see every day, it feels like we're constantly drinking from the fire hose of excess. Mm. What excesses do you battle with in your own life? Today on The Minimalist Podcast, Ryan and I, we're going to talk about escaping the excess. Then this Thursday on the Minimalist Private Podcast, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of asceticism. We'll also discuss the path of aloneness and several reasons we, as a society, are addicted to accumulation. Mm. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalist. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Before we get to our first question, Ryan, our good friend T.K. Coleman Mm. was supposed to be here today. Yeah. And unfortunately, (sighs) a couple days before flying out here to be on the podcast for his 11th appearance, Mm -hmm. he was hit by a car. I know, man. That's crazy. He and his wife were out doing their evening walk, walking across the street. Someone turns left. He's sort of walking on the outside to protect Michelle. And car just hits him Mm. and he goes on top of it and then goes onto the ground. He's all scraped up, beat up Uh, and concussed. It appeared because when the EMTs arrive, they're asking him his name and how many fingers am I holding up, et cetera. Questions to see how with it he is in the moment. mm -hmm. He couldn't answer any of them. Unbelievable. I didn't realize his wife was with him. Yeah. Wow. So he did protect her. Yes. And she was, she was fine. And in in fact, she's the one who ended up calling you know, to get the ambulance and, and make sure that he was safe. And unfortunately, he was hit by a car. And I'm just so grateful that mm. he'll be okay. I mean, he's in a lot of pain right now. So if you want to send him your love, your prayers, your well wishes, you can reach out to him on Twitter or Instagram. Yeah. He's at TK underscore Coleman on Twitter, at official TK Coleman on Instagram. We'll put a link to those in the show notes and yeah. just say that we're uh, we're thinking about him. We appreciate him. We often call him the third minimalist, and he's going to be spending some more time out here on the podcast with us in the coming months, hopefully. But in the meantime, let's send him some well wishes. Yeah. Mm, yeah, he'll appreciate it. Reach out to him on Twitter. Alexandria has a question from Facebook to start the episode. At what point does something become excessive? Excessive. So one person's excess might be too much for them, mm-hmm. but not enough for someone else. So yeah. in that sense, excess can be highly individual. And it got me thinking as I was preparing for this episode, and I thought about Alexandra's question here, the um, definition of success or really The synonyms for success, Mm. surplus, overabundance, superabundance, oversufficiency, profusion, plethora, glut, Mm. too much, more than enough, enough. Well, here's the thing. More than enough is probably the best way to think about excess. Profusion. Yeah. (laughs) But if we have more than enough, then we have excess, right? Mm -hmm. We have too much of a thing. There are a whole bunch of sayings about this, about too much of a good thing will ruin it, right? When you think about, yes, I enjoy eating ice cream or whatever, right? But if they bring me 15 bowls of ice cream one after another, I have a glut Mm. of ice cream and it becomes miserable. There's a bell curve and it starts to become miserable after a while. And that bell curve, you get to that enough point. Mm. And enough means we our needs are met. The material possessions that we have are augmenting or enhancing our experience of life. Mm. But then when we get too much, those things begin to get in the way of what's actually going to enhance our life. And, and so when I am dealing with 
excess, when I'm trying to get rid of excess, Mm -hmm. it's because I'm trying to get back to that enough point. Mm. Yeah, man. I think, you know, when it becomes excessive for me with different things, it, it, uh, it ev- evokes, invokes, evokes, evokes. Um, certain feelings. Yeah. So I think about like the food example. Um, yeah, you eat, I eat too much and then I physically feel heavy. I feel bloated. I feel tired. Mm. Um, if I am, what, what really, um, what this really makes me think of is the Enneagram and how I'm a seven and like, you know, the whole deadly sin is glutton, gluttony. Um, when it comes to things in my life, like if my cal- calendar is over full or if I'm just doing too much and it could be too much of, of a good thing, of good things like um, making plans with friends, going out to dinner, going to a concert, going to the comedy club, you know, doing all the things that because I try to do all the things in Los Angeles. It's impossible to do all the things in L.A. At but, the same time, your plate spinning. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I start to feel anxious. I start to feel like this jittery. um I can tell that like I need to slow down type of feeling because you have excess obligations here. Yes, right. Yeah. And so it's interesting how you talked about the food thing, making you feel bloated, but we become sort of psychologically bloated yeah. when we take on too much excess in other areas of our lives. Yeah. You know, the screen time is a big one because it's so easy. Mm-hmm. It's right there. It's that 79th organ that is in our pocket right? Mm-hmm. The new book I'm reading right now is called The Every. It's Dave Edgar's follow-up to The Circle. It's a wonderful book. It'll probably end up being a added value on a future episode. We'll talk in depth about it. But one of the things, it's, it takes place in a near future, and everyone is now wearing their phone on their forearm, which seems like a natural evolution it does. because we don't have it installed, but it's effectively installed in all of their arms. So they're constantly l- looking down and scrolling the screen that's on their arm. Mm. And I find, and we have a question later about sort of too much social media and and being disconnected because we're so connected, but also being afraid of disconnecting because we think it's going to disconnect us, right? Mm, Yeah. And so the screen, the reason it's so pernicious is it mimics or it apes the form of being productive and good. Getting stuff done. Yes. Yeah. GTD. Mm -hmm. And... Also, it's a status symbol. Look how busy I am, right? Mm -hmm. And it's different for like an addiction to say alcohol or cigarettes, right? Mm -hmm. Because no one is assuming at this point that cigarettes are healthful. Mm -hmm. At one point, people actually did. You know, four out of five doctors recommend camel. I smoke camel. And and doctors would even at one point would prescribe smoking to help with asthma. It's wild. It is wild. And yet we're doing... A similar thing. Now, Mm -hmm. there are some things with respect to our phones where they can be really useful. And that's why it's more pernicious because Mm. this thing that is useful also really can get in the way and make us miserable. Yeah, that's the other thing. When I get too much phone time in, I start to feel uh, like a just a blob. Like I, I'm like dopamine deficient. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm on the phone trying to get those, you know, more dopamine hits because I'm dopamine deficient, but really I'm just like getting into the negative more and the more I stay on the phone. Um, what, what cracks me up, man, is I'll be like looking at Instagram and there's all these, you know, Instagram is basically TikTok, by the way. Like that's what they do with, <laughs> with the, the, the videos on Instagram. Yeah. We call it TikTok too. Right. Yeah, exactly. TikTok too. I'll, I'll, sc- I'll be scrolling through these videos and I'm like, this is so stupid. Why are they? Why are they doing this? And then I go to the next video. Yeah, this person's an idiot too. What are they doing? And then I go to the next video. I'm like, why would you put this video? Why would you put this out there of yourself of doing these little dances and and lip singing, whatever it is? And then I quickly realize, like, wait a minute, I'm the idiot. <laughs> it's actually me who is the moron in this situation. Oh man, so ironic. So uh yeah, and it and it is easy for me to like get into the the stream of TikTok, man, whether it's like cat videos or snowboarding videos or whatever, dude. You know, booty shaking videos. <laughs> you know, you know TikTok is. It's got oh, everything. Yeah. yeah. It makes me every time I find myself going down that rabbit hole, I think of the uh social dilemma. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, they they got you. Uh-huh. Like they know your algorithm. Yeah. They know you really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. They know you better than you know you. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, by the way, I, I, the irony of all this, I think Danny's going to TikTok the whole thing you just talked about with respect to TikTok. Oh, that's okay. It's, it'll be nice. Yeah. Ironic. We're going to feed the uh, 
Well, here's here's the hope of us using social media, right? Is because Ryan and I are often on the fence with respect to do we even want to be on social media at mm-hmm. all anymore. Mm-hmm. But how can we use it to add value? And right. I've been asking that question since 2009. How how can I add value? But especially when we started the minimalists in 2010, it was asking whatever we do. If I send a tweet, if I publish a blog post, if we make a film, we record a podcast, will this add value? Mm -hmm. And if not, then it's what? It's excessive. Mm, Yeah. It's an egoic pursuit. And it's the effort of the ego. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And then I just save it as draft and then eventually go back and delete the draft. Because if it doesn't add value, I don't want to share it. Yeah. Do you think excessiveness does it always relate with the pursuit of ego? Because I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm tempted to say it is. Interesting. Yeah. So possibly, yes. Yeah. And I wrote down a few things. They're in my bag, though. So I'll, I'll pick them up here in a minute. But the the ego isn't good or bad, but it often moves us in ways that move us away from peace or contentment, right? Mm. And in fact... I wanted to talk about this on the Maximal episode. We might as well talk about it now. There are basically three ways to gain acceptance from someone. Mm. There are three ways that you can get other people to accept you. And the first way is how most of us try. And it's actually the most difficult. We buy expensive things or do things to try to impress people. We do things to place us on a pedestal. Mm Mm-hmm. So you will look up to me. Mm. And that is one way to gain acceptance. Look at my Lamborghini. Look at my big house. Look at my fancy suit. Look at my purse with all of the logos on it. Look at these things. They say something about me. I'm up here on a pedestal, and therefore, I'm valid to you. Mm. Now, it's incredibly difficult, but it's even more difficult to sustain because you buy a brand new 2022 Lamborghini... And eight years from now, it's an eight-year-old Lamborghini. How impressive is that? So you have to keep feeding the beast in order to remain valid. Mm. It's not a strategy that works long term. Yeah. The second way is to place yourself on the same level as someone else. Well, how do you do that? Well, by listening, Mm. by conversing, Mm. by being with someone, not convincing them, not forcing your ideas onto them, but merely being with them. Mm. One might call it compassion or empathy. But what a great a great step down. It's so much easier to get someone else's acceptance by simply listening to them, yeah. by being there for them and with them, right? I love and it. The third way is to put yourself below them, mm. to serve other people. Mm. Because if you really want acceptance, you don't need a Lamborghini, you don't need a Rolex, you don't need a purse with a bunch of logos on it. You can simply serve someone. You can help them. Because if you help someone and they accept that help, then they're accepting you for who you are. And here's the bonus fourth way. It's to not need the acceptance at all. Ooh, Because if I don't need your validation, your veneration, I don't need you to think a particular way about me, Mm -hmm. then yes, I can still own the things I want to own. I don't need them to impress you anymore. I can still be with you because I want to be with you, but not because I need your validation. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, I can still serve you. I can still help you. Not because you need me, but simply because I need to help other people. Mm. And if I understand that, then I don't need your acceptance at all. Mm. I love it, man. That's great. I got some more questions here. How about we dive into Lisa's question from Patreon? I see so many people who are overwhelmed by the excess caused by workaholism, addiction, and FOMO. How do we encourage others to break away from these people-pleasing behaviors? Mm. Ultimately, they're all addictions here we're talking about. So workaholism is an addiction. Now, FOMO is a little bit different. The fear of missing out. I want Mm. to talk about the peace of missing out for a second. Mm. Peace, P-E-A-C-E. The peace of missing out. I really need to hear this right now. POMO. POMO. 
not postmodern POMO, <laughs> but the piece of missing out. And so let, let's talk about this. So you're in Montana, Ryan. Yeah. And you're right there at the Clark Fort River. Yeah. It's June and July. People are wading down the river. They're tubing, right? Mm-hmm. Now imagine if you tried to experience all of the river. Mm. You couldn't. You can't right. touch all of the water and the stream. Even if it's a small creek, you can't submerge yourself in the full stream indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And yet, you can still experience the stream mm -hmm. for what it is. Yeah. And life, more broadly speaking, is merely a stream. And we can dip our toes in the water when we want, or we can just sit back and observe it. Mm -hmm. You're not missing out on the stream by observing it. You're experiencing peace by not needing to dive in and take in every drop of it. Mm. Yeah. I dig it, man. Yeah, I, I I, really do have a problem with FOMO, especially like I was talking about earlier, like just living in LA trying to do all the things. Mm -hmm. I remember it wasn't that long ago. I'm like, Mariah, we don't do enough. Like we're missing out on so much. She's like, what are you talking? She starts listing things. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess we do. We do do a lot in Los Angeles. But yeah, there's always like a concert I missed or a comedy show I missed or a festival I missed or an art, you know, art show I missed. Mm. Um, but I, I do, I do get more and more peace from it, but it, that's, it, that is definitely something that I struggle with. And I do, uh, I do start to like, when I get that feeling, I do start to kind of list out what Mariah and I have done. And I do feel more peaceful. I'm like, Oh, okay, man. Like you're, you're out there experiencing it. You know, you can't experience everything. It's okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky to experience the things I experienced to begin with, let alone, you know, asking for more. And, and why do we do any of these things? Whether it's workaholism, any kind of addiction, whether it's smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, drinking mm -hmm. coffee, that's my addiction, mm -hmm. right? Why do we do these things? Well, it's mm -hmm. to chase pleasure, essentially. Right? Stimulation, yeah. It, and why do we want pleasure? It's really running from pain. And that's what FOMO is, by the way. Mm. When we're constantly trying to go out and keep ourselves busy, keep our mind busy, our hand busy, our time busy, our calendar busy because of FOMO. Mm -hmm. Well, what are we really afraid of? It's not missing out. We're afraid of being bored by ourselves. Yeah. We're afraid of spending time with ourselves. So we do whatever we can. We hop on YouTube or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok to spend time allowing people to permeate our thoughts, to maybe manipulate our beliefs, to make us want to purchase things and make us feel inadequate, right? Yeah. And, and when we do that, we are always going to feel like we're missing out. Mm. And because we are missing out on a meaningful relationship with ourselves and we're outsourcing those thoughts to, uh, we're outsourcing the control of our thoughts to everyone else. Yeah. Mm. Let's move on to our callers. You have a question or a comment for our podcast. You can give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. Looks like we have a question here from Melanie in Duluth, Minnesota. How do you do time management? I'm the sort of person who needs a paper planner, but now it's at the point where I have a paper planner with three inserts that I keep swapping out and I don't find planner piece. Um, so how do you function when you need to write things down and you're not just working from a screen? So Melanie, the I hear the tension in your voice. And you're looking for how to. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are some cosmetic things you might be able to do that will improve your efficiency. Mm -hmm. But there's no how to here. Right. This is an understanding of what the real problem is. The problem isn't a lack of Franklin planners in your life. <laughs> right. Now, those tools can be helpful. Sure. Now, some tools might be helpful for you. They might get in the way for me. I know Podcast Sean uses a uh, like a, a written planner, a, a physical planner. Yeah. But for me, that would be an accoutrement that simply got in the way. However, if I were to hand him my system, he would be like, oh, this doesn't work for me. Right. I remember uh, when Jessica, our social media manager, she was having a time of being disorganized in her life. And she finally found a organizational tool that worked really well for her. It's uh, something called Asana. Yeah. And I've tried to use that in the past, the, these different Asana boards, and it 
added clutter to my life. When she explains it, like it gets, it got me excited about it. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. But then like, yeah, I go to use it and I'm like, it just it doesn't click for me like it clicks for her. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. And so what I'm going to ask Melanie is, it sounds like you want to escape the excess here. Mm-hmm. And that's the title of this episode. But really, you can escape the excess only by not trying to escape. Here's what I mean. But because here's here's where you're at right now. Oh, it's so frantic. It's so frantic. Let me add more. Mm-hmm. Uh, more, 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 whatever it is to the equation mm-hmm. as though more is going to get me out of this, right? Right. No, your default state is peace. You can't plan peace. She said planner peace, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Peace cannot be planned. Now, we do get confused and we think that We're pursuing peace. We're pursuing happiness. There are multiple kinds of happiness. There's the happiness feeling that we get when we have an achievement or we buy something and we get that dopamine rush when we're on TikTok and, oh, my gosh, I watched that dance video 13 times. That's a dopamine rush. That's a a feeling of happiness. Mm -hmm. But it's not the human state of happiness or peace or contentment, which is a default setting. It cannot be pursued. It's not somewhere out there. You're not going to plan your way to peace. You're not going to plan your way to happiness. Mm. You can, the only path to peace is realizing that it, it's already there. Mm-hmm. You, the journey is that you're already there. Mm. You don't have to go anywhere to get there. You are there already. And so adding more, 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 more planning, more planners, more commitments, more obligations, more calendar clutter is merely going to get in the way of your peace. Mm. So what's on the other side of this? If peace is on the other side of the clutter, the calendar clutter, well, how do you get there? By doing less, by saying no, so you can say yes to peace. It doesn't matter which calendar or app you're using to do that, but having fewer things planned out will inherently bring you more peace because you're not going from A to B to C to D. That's the frenetic life I lived. I remember our meeting Mondays back in the corporate world. I had nine meetings in a row. Nine one-hour meetings back to back to back to back to back. In fact, we would even have a lunch meeting Mm -hmm. and work through lunch to meet. We had pre-meeting meetings. We had a one post-meeting meeting. We had a pre-marketing meeting meeting. And so it was all really well planned, but there was very little peace there. Mm-hmm. You know, that saying, uh, every day we stray further and further away from God. I think it should be, uh, every day we stray further and further away from peace. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> They say God is love, God is peace, whatever you, you know, regardless of what your religious or spiritual right. beliefs are, mm-hmm. all of the wisdom traditions recognize an inner peace, mm-hmm. an inner harmony. And we're trying to harmonize with the world around us, but it's already going on inside you right now. Mm. Yeah. Melanie, one other thing you can do is you can set up some boundaries in your life. They help you say no to the things that are less important. I'd love for you to download our free minimalist rule book. It's 16 rules for living with less. You can find it over at theminimalists.com slash rule book or podcast. Sean, if you could reach out to her, send her the audiobook version that's available now too. And uh, secretly, it's one of my favorite things that we've ever done. Yeah. Ryan and I got into a studio a couple of years ago and we, we just talked about all 16 rules and invented some new rules on the fly. Mm -hmm. And so I would read out the rule and then he and I would have this deep conversation about it. And it's uh, two or three hours long. You can check that out at theminimalists.com slash rule book as well. But some of those rules in there, they're adjustable. So they'll allow you to set up some boundaries. Anything outside of that boundary, Mm -hmm. you begin saying no to. And Mm -hmm. it's easier because anything within that boundary, you know, I'm saying yes to this. And so when you're saying no to something else, you can tell people, actually, I'm saying yes to the things within bounds for me. So I have to say no to that. We got any questions from the live stream, Alabama? We do. We have a question here from Kathy. What are some ways to keep my mind on one priority when I have emotional clutter that pulls my thoughts in all directions? Worry, fear, failure, not being good enough. Ooh, man. And all about that 
those feelings <laughs> in that situation. Uh, for me, like meditation really helps. I mean, it's so funny because it's such a simple answer. And we hear that as an answer to a lot of things. But, you know, it's a it's a cliche for a reason because it really does help help uh, just help, help helps me stay focused a little bit more. Um, the other thing, too, is maybe, you know, Kathy, if there's like some things that are constantly eating at you, um, you might want to go, you know, get a listening ear, whether that's a friend or whether it's a therapist. Like I've got an awesome therapist. And when things eat at me, I reach out to him and I'm like, Hey man, like I need, I need to talk to you for an hour. Like I need you to help me like, you know, frame this in a way that isn't gonna, uh, that's going to keep this thought from basically ruining my days. Mm. Um, and, and that to me, that's when I, that's when I always need to go see a therapist and talk to him is when like I'm waking up and I have something on my mind and then, you know, I'll make some coffee and then it's on my mind and then I go to eat lunch and then it's on my mind and it's just doing that day after day after day. That's where I'm like, oh, wow, like this is actually preventing me from having peace. I, I need to go get some help there. Let's do a little exercise here because her name's Kathy. Is that right? So Kathy, you mentioned four things I wrote down, worry, fear, failure, not good enough. Mm. Right. You're afraid of not being good enough. And so here's one thing that we almost never do. We never stop and say, why? Mm. Okay. Why am I worried? What's behind that worry? And so maybe it is, I'm worried that someone's going to reject me. Mm. Well, well, why? Well, because I want to be accepted. Why? why? <laughs> oh, because when I'm accepted, I feel it validates me. Right. I feel valid. Right. Mm -hmm. well, why is that important? Well, because I want to matter to other people. Why? And what you start to do is you ask yourself why. Go 12 layers deep. Don't stop at the first or second answer. Keep doing the why. Mm -hmm. Why am I afraid of failure? Mm -hmm. Well, because I want to project an image onto the world that I am perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, a one that I've certainly struggled with in the past. But then as soon as you, I, you find the why behind that, it has to do with acceptance. We talked earlier about the three ways to gain acceptance from someone. You can impress them, you can be with them, or you can serve them, mm -hmm. right? But as soon as you keep asking why, you realize that maybe you don't need their acceptance. Mm -hmm. When you see people who really don't give a damn, right? If you, now most people affect that and they're the people who care the most. I don't know why, but Hunter S. Thompson came to mind right away when he said people who don't give a damn. Now he didn't, right? <laughs> and he didn't need anyone's acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason he didn't is he understood the why and the absurdity mm. of needing someone else's approval. Yeah. Because you can't control the way other people feel about you. Yes, you might have a little bit of influence. Yeah. If you approach the world in a loving, caring way, you may get many of those same reactions back, but it's yeah. certainly not guaranteed. And if you need a particular outcome when mm -hmm. interacting with someone, mm -hmm. then yes, there's an expectation there. And that expectation is going to lead to your discontent because there's always going to be a time where someone misses your expectation. Mm. And now if you needed them to behave or be a particular way and they haven't, Wow, you're in for a world of disappointment. Amen. Let's talk about how we can't control the way other people think about us. Okay. Because I actually came across this uh, yesterday. And man, how much detail do I want to give? Let's just say, I'll just say that Mariah and I were having a conversation about someone who was upset with me. Mm -hmm. And this came up where I was like, oh, we can't really, I can't control what people think of me. But then when I thought about how I thought about this person, I'm like, well, their actions have actually set up my opinion of them. So in a way, they did. They can control the way I think of them. Does that make sense? So is, is there a caveat there? Or am I like, help me clarify this. Yeah. So yeah. let's say let's say that you were just constantly insulted me. Uh -huh. um, you know, whatever. Ryan, you're a smelly hippie and yeah. you're, you're too handsome. I don't like it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and other insults that I hear all the time. <laughs> yes. But let's say that you were always insulting me. And then, you know, not just through your words, but through your actions, you were constantly just showing me that um, I wasn't even on your radar. You could care less about me, yada, 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 right? So, mm -hmm. so to that extent, there is some 
control that you have over the way I think of you. Does well, that make only, sense? Yes, you, you're absolutely right. And it's because you're giving me that control, though. Mm. If mm -hmm. you didn't allow what I said to you to do anything to you, you know, if just like if I so if because you have I've earned some a place in your life that you probably respect my feedback more than the random person on the street. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to say something to you versus a random person on the street said the same exact thing, I'm probably going to have more influence over the way you react to it. Yeah. But well, when yeah. you recognize that, well, I'm choosing to react that way yeah. and I would choose to react differently. I would not take it as seriously when someone else is hurling insults at me. I mean, think about if, if, uh, if a three-year-old started insulting you, like that'd right. be kind of cute. <laughs> right? Aww. Yeah. These are the cutest insults. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, all right, so let's take you out of the equation. Let's talk about the guy in the corner. Yes. I mean, there's not literally a guy in the corner right now, but let's say there was. And every time I walked into the office, he was just treating me poorly. Now I have an opinion of this man at this point where he now like, yeah, I get to choose how I react to him. But, you know, um, the, but what I think about him is, is based on his actions. I guess, let me, let me tell you where I got to. And you tell me if this is like the right viewpoint or not. So it's, I, I the caveat of, I can't control the way people, uh, I can't control what people think about me or the way that they see me. The caveat to that is, you know, if I am, if I'm living like a genuine life, or if I am, uh, you know, being my true self, however you want to look at it. After that, I can't control how people think of me. Mm. Is that, is that not, I don't know, yeah. man, help me, help, help me with that. Y you're, you're right. I mean, what people think about you might change the way that you behave. And, mm. and so it depends on what you mean by your true self, right? Because we all have personalities. Your personality is merely your mask that mm -hmm. you, I'm going to show myself to the world this way. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's relatively congruent to your internal self, mm -hmm. but there's always a filter through which people see you, mm -hmm. your identity that you've created for yourself, right? Sure. And so, yes, there are people in your life who they will affect the way you behave, but they don't have to affect you. You're essentially outsourcing that power to them. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Like I want to be around people who treat me kindly as well. But when that becomes my need, mm. I'm imprisoning myself with their, with their outcomes. Yeah. Maybe it's more of the lines of like, I can't control how people, people perceive me because the perception is very um, individual mm -hmm. and one person might look at Ryan Nicodemus and say oh he's a really swell guy and someone else might look at him and be like oh he's he's so out of touch with reality whatever it is mm -hmm. um, and at that point I have no I have no control over how someone perceives me but if I am you know if, if I'm going around like causing harm to people then there is, I mean, that that that's going to create, you know, this this thought of, hey, Ryan Nicodemus is a jerk, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what are your intentions behind that? And and so, of course, we're not talking about violence here. And yeah, that, right, that's course, a, yeah. a separate thing. Sure. Um, we can set that aside. But think about someone like Gary Vee, for example, mm -hmm. who was supposed to be on the, on the show and then we had a, a thing, it didn't work out. But when I think about someone like Gary Vee, People are very polarized about some people think, oh, my gosh, look at this guy. He's like the Messiah of hustle. Right. Right. The patron saint of hustle. Yeah. And other people are like, oh, my God, I can't stand that guy. Right. 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 And if he was constantly trying to get validation from the people who are like, I can't stand that guy, mm -hmm. then he'd have to change his behavior in a way that actually harmed the people who did appreciate what he does. Yeah. And so we get caught up because what we try to do, we, then we try to be a chameleon. I'm going to be a particular way for Ryan. I'm going to be a different way for this person and mm -hmm. for Mallory and for podcast Sean and for Jordan. Right. We get exhausted trying to wear a bunch of different masks. And, and someone like me, who's a three on the Enneagram, mm. it's easy for me to be like, okay, how would, what's the best way to identify with podcast Sean or with Danny unknown, mm -hmm. right? 
how do I identify with, well, I put on a slightly different mask, yeah. right? And that's what my former self would have done with regularity, right? Yeah. As opposed to simply showing up and being me. Right. Because it's much less about how people don't remember your words. They remember how you approach the world. Yeah. And so how you walk into a room, how you hug people or or your demeanor around other people. Mm-hmm. You encounter a negative person and you give them good news, they'll find a way to spin it negatively. Right. If you give negative news to an a, extremely optimistic person, not mm-hmm. because they affect op- optimism, but because they are truly optimistic, mm-hmm. you can give them bad news and they'll find the the their own individual authentic spin Mm -hmm. as to how you can learn from this. For me, suffering is one of those things, but suffering is one of the worst things that's worst, best things that's ever happened to me (laughs) because it rearranges all of your perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, yes, how you approach the world, people will see that and via their own lens Mm -hmm. because they have their own baggage they're carrying into that situation. Mm -hmm. I can't believe Ryan is so gregarious. It really turns me off. So what are you going to do? You're going to turn that down? Are you going to stop showing up? Because you stop showing up, then the people you're loving also lose out on the best version of you. Yeah. So that's what it is. It's like if you're trying to put on a mask, like that's it's going to make you miserable because like there's not enough masks for you to wear. And by the way, one mask is going to please someone and it's going to displease another. Without a doubt. Right. So all you can do is show up and be you. And that's all you can do. Yes. And and there are versions of you as well. And understanding that because Mm -hmm. if I'm an extreme introvert, so I spend all my time around a bunch of other people, I would become drained and Mm -hmm. I would be a lesser version of my peak self or ideal self, right? Mm -hmm. And so by being able to retreat and be alone more frequently, I'm able to show up when I am around people and be a more ideal version of me. Now, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that the drained version of me is not actually me. It is me when I'm drained. Mm -hmm. And, And so understanding that part of me, if I've run out of energy, run out of gas, then to step back and, mm-hmm. and to recharge in those situations. Yeah. Now, for someone like you, it, it might mean you have a much fuller tank than me mm-hmm. and you're able to show up. But also recognizing that some people aren't going to have a, a positive reaction mm-hmm. to someone who's outgoing and, and charismatic. Yeah. But that's not up to you to determine their reaction. Right. They're going to have their reaction regardless. Yeah. And the more I need them to have a particular reaction, the more I'm imprisoned by my own desires. Yeah. Mm. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions, your comments to area code 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. You can also find all of our minimal maxims in one place minimalmaxims.com. Ryan, I wrote down a few minimal maxims I wanted to share with respect to excess before we get to Kristen's question here. Cool, let's do it. These aren't from me necessarily, but one of them is. But uh, one's from Henry David Thoreau. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things which he can afford to let alone. Mm. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things which he can afford to let alone. Interesting. I thought that comment was going in a completely different direction, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. So the more that we need, the more that we can't let alone, oh, I really need the bigger house. I need the salary. I need the job title. I need the studio. I need whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The more that I need, the less rich I become. Right. When I need next to nothing, then everything that I get becomes a gift that I can experience when I don't need it. When I recognize I already have enough, enough isn't on the other side of the mountain. Just like happiness isn't on the other side of the mountain or Mm. contentment or joy. It's all here right now. Regardless of what your religious or spiritual beliefs are, Mm. you have enough. And the things that we put around us, if we're not careful, they become excess really quickly. And that excess makes us less rich. Mm. So you can have a rich man, a truly wealthy individual with 
multi-million dollar bank account who's impoverished by desire, impoverished by Ooh. their need to acquire more, impoverished by their need to impress other people, impoverished by their desire for acceptance among peers and followers. Makes me think of MC Hammer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, I, mean, I mean, how much did he get? 50 million, 60 million something? Yeah. And he was bankrupt with, within 10 years. And why was that? Because he, because of his desires. Now, he was a very giving man. So, you know, he basically made an announcement in like the neighborhood he grew up in. Hey, if you need a job, come and ask me. I won't turn you down. Yeah. So he, you know, he employed a lot of people. He had a big heart. Yes. But he also had a really big house. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a big house to uh, hold that big heart of his. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like because of his need, um, because of his needs. Uh, yeah. He ended up going broke when he, he, he was richer than you and I will ever be. He had a well-decorated prison cell, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Here's another one that we all know about. The things you own end up owning you. Mm. It's from Chuck Palahniuk yeah. in uh, his book, Fight Club. And well, what does that say about excess? It means the things that we own, they amplify us, but they own us when we cling to them, mm. when we must have them, mm. when we can't live without them. Mm. Now... They own us. Mm. And then here's a short one for you. This is from theminimalists.com. Our possessions dispossess. And so to dispossess means to remove property or remove land or remove something from someone, right? But as we get more things, those things remove something from our lives, a yeah. purpose or meaning that we experience without those things. And so as we accumulate more and more, our possessions dispossess. Yeah. It is great. Like the more you get, the more you realize like it's, it, the possessions are never enough. Like it is, uh, like, I feel like I have enough right now. I mean, I, I am fortunate enough to like be able to live in LA and, you know, food on the table, pay my utilities, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like I have enough because, you know, those basic needs are met mm -hmm. and my desires are very low for, for more. And I've, you know, we've been practicing over the last 11 years to get to that point. Right. But, um, you know, even me like moving to LA, I, I started to get this twinge of like, oh man, it'd be really nice to have a Tesla. It'd be really nice to own a house here in LA. It'd be really like all these things that never in my life did I think I would you know, really, well, I shouldn't say never in my life, but over the last 10 years, like I wouldn't think that I'd come to LA and have those feelings, but I was, I'm able to kind of see the the truth behind those desires mm -hmm. and kind of hit them head on. So not to say that I don't have those desires, but I can process them a little bit differently where um, a lot of people don't know how to process those desires. They just think, well, the way to process it is to get it. And then I'll, then I'll be complete. Yes. But it's, but like, I just remember the, 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 Tran the, tr the transgression from living in Dayton, Ohio, we became the minimalists. We wrote a book and then we started going on tour and every city we went to was like this new, awesome experience. And I'll never forget, like, you know, the first time going to Portland, the first, th first time coming to LA, the first time going to San Francisco, but specifically with Saskatoon. Yes. Saskatoon. I'll never forget that red lobster, <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting though. Cause we were living in Dayton. My rent was, I don't know, 450 bucks. I mean, it was like, it was super cheap in Piqua, Ohio. And uh, we come out to LA, uh, we go to San Francisco, New York City. You know, you start to ask, how much does it cost to live in this city? Yeah. And then you start to find out rent prices and you're like, oh my God. Right. I could never afford to live in X city. Yeah. And then here I am living in X city. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, oh, I'll never be able to afford a Tesla. I'll never be able to afford MC Hammer's home. <laughs> <laughs> and and some of these things might be true. Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to afford MC Hammer's home. And if I am, I would never buy it anyway. Right, 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 right. right. And so the Tesla thing is interesting because there's nothing wrong with owning a Tesla, no, right? No. Mm -hmm. I like coal-powered cars. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, and no, it, yeah. I, and and my, my point is that by owning an electric vehicle, 
you might actually be doing something that is really helpful for the environment. The question is, can I afford all of the other costs involved? Because when we're talking about excess, we're not just talking about the excess cost of a thing and excess debt. That's a big part of it for sure, because you want excess stress, excess discontent, go into debt. Mm. And that's an easy shortcut it's the worst to stress. anxiety. That is the worst kind of stress. Right. And so what you're what you've identified is I already have enough. And if mm. at some point a Tesla makes sense. I don't have to have it, mm -hmm. but it'd be okay if I did too. Yeah. But as soon as I need it for happiness, contentment, love, whatever it is, mm -hmm. we start to need all of these things that are external to us. Yeah. I need a relationship in order to love. Well, no, you can be loving without a relationship, mm -hmm. without being married. You can still be loving. Yeah. Oh, I need this house in order to live well. No, you don't need to own a house to live well. Mm. You can live well without a house. You can live well in a house as well. Mm. I need the right job in order to be accepted by people in my circle. Nope, you don't need a job to be accepted. All you mm. need to do is serve other people. Or if you could take it farther, you can just stop needing to be accepted, mm. right? But there are easier ways, even if you want to get acceptance. Mm to become accepted by other people. And so we have all of this excess. We have relationship excess, we have calendar excess, and we certainly have material possession excess. And we have that because we think happiness is right around the corner. And it is, but it's here as well. So you can travel around the corner and you'll be bringing happiness with you. We just got to stop covering up with the things that are making us so unhappy because happiness is the default state. And if you want to learn how to let go, here's how you do it. You realize that your default setting is not discontentment. You've been taught by advertisers and by corporations and by marketers that your default state is to be discontent. No, your default state is contentment. It's peace. It's joy. It's love. And it can only be covered up by excess. Mm. We have a question here from Kristen. I've tried so many apps to help me stay organized, but have made little progress. Do you have any tips on how to cut down on excessive screen time? Here's my pithy answer for you. You need to buy more apps. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer, Milburn. Have you checked out the Minimalist's new app? <laughs> Just kidding. We don't have an app. Uh, mm. Although if we did, it'd be fine. No, we it, do have an app. The Nothing app. Oh, we did. So this is a... <laughs> you can go to YouTube, type in the Minimalist's, the Nothing app. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. That's even better. Uh, we did an April Fool's joke, the Nothing app. It's mm. wonderful. Yeah. Here's my pithy answer for you since we're running out of time, Kristen. If poisoned by excess, more poison will not save you. Mm, it reminded me when we were at a live event, someone came up to the mic and they're like, you know, I bought all the financial books. I've bought the financial courses and I just can't seem to get my money problems under control. And my pithy answer was like, you can't spend your way out of debt. And this is very similar. You can't, you cannot app your way out of disorganization. <laughs> Kristen, for the sake of time, I'm going to, I was going to go dive deep into six best practices to reduce the digital clutter. In your life, I'm going to save that for the maximal episode this week because Ryan has something pithy for you. Yes, my pithy answer is this. An app can't take action. Only you can. And that is where I think you might be uh, getting tripped up here. There's not an app that is going to take the action for you. It's, it's you taking the action yourself. Quite often, the app apes the form of action. I downloaded the app. Why isn't my life better? Right. And apps can help organize. And like, I'm not saying that apps aren't useful, but they're a tool. It's not the... It's not, you're not, you cannot uh, sublease or sublet your, uh, your, your, your action to an app. That's right. Yeah. It, it might help you just like a hammer can help a carpenter, but the carpenter buys a hammer and it doesn't do the work. Yeah. For I bought him. the hammer and the nails. I don't know what's going on. Why isn't this house built now? Right. Yeah. And so buying the thing apes the form of taking some sort of action, mm -hmm. but that's not real action. Yeah. You and got this, Kristen. And it's certainly not understanding. Mm. And Kristen, what I want to help you with is the understanding. So on the maximum up of this episode this week, I'll do six best practices to help with digital clutter and to reduce your excessive screen time. We've got a bunch more to talk about, but real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. 
I usually teach a, a four-week writing class. It's called How to Write Better. You can find it over at howtowritebetter.org. You can download my free ebook over there. It's called 15 Ways to Write Better. But we don't have a open class right now, but we're getting ready to do a two-hour workshop. Sean Mahalik, my, my adjunct professor and I, he's going to do this uh, workshop with me on May 29th. It's a two-hour workshop. If you can attend live, you'll be able to ask questions. I'm also going to go over these different rules to improve your writing. I want to help you learn how to write better in just two hours. It's uh, for folks who can't necessarily afford the the time or the money for the larger four-week class. Well, now there's a one-day, two-hour workshop that we'll be able to spend some time together on May 29th. It'll also be available thereafter if you buy a ticket beforehand. HowToWriteBetter.org for all the details. Alabama. Here's some uh, voicemail comments. What do you got for us? Here's some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Philly from the UK here. I've been catching up on your podcast and occasionally hear people who want to give up convenience shopping, such as Amazon, to help them avoid mindless consumption. This won't work for everyone, but I have found that I can often completely switch off the desire for a brand if I look into their production in more detail. This could be the way they treat people, the planet, animals, how they deal with toxic waste, what they invest in, and so on. In the UK, this information is easily found with the magazine Ethical Consumer, but I do pay to subscribe to them. Some of their research is free. I don't know if there is a US equivalent, but they do cover many global brands. I find this helps me create a barrier to easy consumption, and it has helped me avoid acquiring countless items over the past few years, and also ensures I'm very intentional about what I do buy. Hopefully this could help others too. My name is Betsy. I'm from upstate New York. Uh, I have a message for Jean, the woman on your podcast about building a tiny house, um, and she was looking for ways to minimize her kitchen. Um, I recommend uh, looking into an instant pot, it's a all-in-one pressure cooker, slow cooker, rice cooker, yogurt maker. I, it's best if you uh, YouTube or Google it rather than listen to me rave about it. But it sure saves a lot of space and uh, it saves on extra appliances. All right, y'all. Before we get to our added value segment this week, here's a lovely comment from one of our thoughtful private podcast supporters over on Patreon. Jordan Brooks says, hello, Joshua and Ryan. I just have to say that I love you guys. Oh, we love you too, Jordan. I just finished listening to all of the free minimalist episodes. Then I tried to listen to a different podcast, but as soon as I started <laughs> it, I was forced to listen to the same McDonald's advertisement twice. Ooh. And it made me realize how much I value the minimalists and all the patrons who make this podcast advertisement free. So I stopped the other podcast and joined the minimalist private podcast on Patreon. I'm super happy to be here. That is, that's awesome. That's, you know what, man, I'm, it, what we're doing is uh, uh, adding value to people's lives by removing the advertisements, man. I love that. Cause like, I'll listen to whatever. And yeah, as soon as an ad pops up, I'm like, why? Why right in the middle of this thing? Like, at least when a TV show does it, it's like a nice clean break. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we'll be back. Anyway. Yeah, even then, it's so yeah. like, oh, yeah, it is. And, and so, Jordan, thank you. And by the way, for those of you who aren't supporting the private podcast, it's a completely separate show every week. Every Thursday, we do an hour or two hours, sometimes three hours occasionally. And uh, we dive deep into some things we don't typically talk about in public. So this isn't like a bonus content club where you get table scraps. No, most of what we create is actually over on the private podcast every Thursday. And also all of our archives are over there. Hundreds of hours of minimalism. You don't want to listen to it all necessarily, but start with the most recent ones and find the ones that are going to add the most value to your life. There's so much gold over there on the private podcast, things that we don't bring on to the public podcast. Every Thursday, you can check out the Maximal episode. It's a completely separate episode. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist for our added value this week, Ryan. Mm. I think I might call an audible on this one. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to call an audible. Since we're talking about stuff, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be an ascetic, although we're going to talk about asceticism on the 
Maximal episode this mm-hmm, week, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm actually going to recommend a few things that have been useful for me. I'm not going to prescriptionize it, though, mm. but I'm going to call an audible here. So, uh, Sean, start playing a song for me right now. It's called New Shoes by Paolo Nutini. It came out in uh, 2006. You remember that song, Ryan? It was in the odds, yeah. I got my new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's playing in the background right now. My new shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I got these new pair of shoes here. Oh, nice. And uh, I used to wear Toms all the time. If you're watching the video version, you can see my shoe here. This is not a sponsored ad. It's certainly not an advertisement. They don't send me shoes. If they look they, comfy. If they tried to send me shoes, I'd say, no, thank you. Is, I, are those it, rubber? Is that rubber or is it cloth? It is uh, top secret material, oh space age. <laughs> Very aerodynamic. The What's the brand? I don't even know the brand. Suaves? S-U-A-V-S. Oh, wow. From back here, it looks like Vans. That's I was like... I they was look gonna, similar to Vans. Yeah. But they're... I used to wear Toms, but the quality of them, I used to always remove the logos because I hate logos in my mm-hmm. things. This one has, you can barely see it here, yeah. but uh, they're super comfortable and I have wide feet so that my feet fit in these really well. And they're they're very comfortable and I walk a lot. So I walk mm. maybe eight miles a day on average. They got these insoles here. I dig them, man. And uh, it just, and you can replace, wash the insoles, you can replace they're, them. They're breathable. They're super breathable. You can see actually like how, how breathable I, they are. I didn't wear Toms for two reasons. One, my feet sweat so much yes. that like the, I would blow them out. Like they would just, they started smelling really funky. But then also like, let's say you get past the smell and I would wear them like, yeah, like I needed to replace them like every six months or so. Like the quality wasn't that good. And so I went and bought uh, a couple pairs of these because I wear them pretty much every day now. Dude. And I'm not recommending them to you here because here's the truth. You probably don't need some new shoes right now. Mm -hmm. So please don't go out and buy some new shoes. Right. And also these shoes, they work really well for me. They might not work for you. Mm. Just like the shoes that Ryan wears. He he wears those zero shoes and those didn't really work well for me for whatever reason. And it doesn't mean they work awesome for him. And so I'm not saying go out and buy some new shoes. But if you are looking for some new shoes eventually, these have worked really well for me. And plus, I really enjoy Paolo Nutini's new shoes song which is playing in the background still right now. By the way, Ryan, we got a bunch more surprise questions this week, like what are 21 principles for radically simplifying your life? How do we manage expectations from others that exceed our own? Is it possible to quit social media without cutting off my social connections? Plus, A million more questions for The Minimalist. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist private podcast this week. I already gave you all the details, but you also get access to all of the archives, live events, Ask The Minimalist Anything sessions, a whole bunch of stuff we've created over there for you at patreon.com slash The Minimalist. Also an open-minded community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Minimalist. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Malabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, Danny Unknown, Triple P. That's a pot post-production Peter. <laughs> Was that the winner? Yeah, I think so. Nice. Peter Duff mixing, by the way. He uh, he mixes the episodes for us. We're calling him Triple P now. Triple P, all right. All right, Emma the Immigrant and the rest of our team. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things. Because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see ya. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it